work primarily with numbers and believe that science and math would be a universal language. But here's the tricky part for that, is that if you look at all the different ways that mathematics, and even advanced mathematics, can be expressed on Earth, um, it's not just one way. So, um, like I said, people from anthropology and the social sciences tend to be a little bit less optimistic about decryption um, than uh, those coming in from the physical sciences and mathematics. Related to that, there's also the question of, you know, how languages evolve. I think a big question again, would be how much help are we getting from the alien side of things. If they were transmitting in their natural evolved language, we'd have to assume that just as is the case on Earth, it would be full of reference to their home environment, which would not be the same as ours. It you know, could have some similarities. The more that we see about exoplanets, the more we realize that some could be quite Earth-like. So there may be similarities in the environments, but every aspect of our natural languages of our speech is just infused with the world that we are from. And that's okay when you are co-present in a place and time, and you can, say, point at an object and say, rock. (laughs) Then, you know, the other person comes back to you and gives you the word for rock in their language. That can work there. But if the referent is um, not only absent, but not even shared in theory, then I think we have a real semantic problem. But nothing would spur on an effort to make a translation quite like the discovery of a signal. Pippa Goldschmidt reminded us how quickly science fiction can become reality. Perhaps we get a bit complacent about some aspects of science fiction being firmly placed in the future. But of course, you know, the future always happens uh, at some points. So, yeah, this kind of speculative, anticipatory type of fiction, if it suddenly becomes reality, is it would be a whole sort of step change. I, I, I think I'm kind of fascinated by the, by the processes, by the scientific processes and how people carry out science. So I'd be really sort of, uh, I'd be really interested uh, in using fiction, I already have in a sense, in using fiction to try and open up those processes by which we would, say, receive uh, sort of extraterrestrial intelligence uh, sort of um, signals and what we'd actually do about them and then how, how, how we'd respond to that. I'd probably sort of want to get into the detail, the sort of the inherent conflict of the situation. You know, fiction always, art always likes conflict. And there's, as we've already discussed, there's a lot of potential conflict in that. Ray Adams, who works for an asteroid mining company, also feels that this type of discovery would accelerate a change in our priorities. One of the fastest ways I think we could um, really come into our own as a spacefaring civilization would be if we detected signs of life other than ours out there, you know, really anywhere in in the galaxy. Um, I don't think it would really matter how far. I think it would have such a profound shift in the way we think about our interaction with each other on a planet, that that's now all of a sudden so much more important in a way and less significant in others. So this sense of being together as a species is not one that that I think resonates today with people um, in the same way it would if there was you know other life. I think there would be a renewed interest in a, a way that we've probably never seen in exploring the solar system and understanding what it means to be a part of an ecosystem that extends, you know, farther than we can really even imagine as far as distances go, right? We, we talk in light years and that, that doesn't even really, we don't even know what a light year is. We really have this whole spectrum of opinion on translating alien transmissions. Yeah. We've heard everything from this is the most important thing that has ever happened to humanity, period, and it will bring us together in magnificent and earth-shattering ways, to this will be a blip on our social memory because people don't care to deeply invest in a difficult translation process. I really can't get behind the fact that nobody would want to try. Yes, but the challenges of translation are quite significant. Well, yeah, but think about when we were in Paris. We were so frustrated because we couldn't understand people. If someone was really trying to reach out, I, I believe we would make an effort. I mean, do you really think we would just ignore an alien species? It also seems like it would be such a missed opportunity. For what? For us to learn about ourselves as humans and our potential to collaborate globally on something intrinsically linked to human discovery. The discovery of another civilization on another planet is something that we have been speculating on for millennia. It is so essential to our questions about who we are and what our place is in the universe and what it means to be conscious. Would we really just decide not to try? 
This has been Transmission Podcast, hosted by Cecilia Lynn Jacobs and produced by Ian Garrett and Kate Ladenheim. We're glad to have you along on this journey to understand each other. On this episode, you heard... Pippa Goldschmitz. Catherine Denning. Pete Warden. Christine Corbett Moran. Ray Adams. Original composition and sound editing by Miles Avery. Transmission is a podcast and performance series speculating on what might happen if we began to receive the popular broadcasts of intelligent alien life and follows two sisters selected to lead an interstellar mission to make first contact. Learn more about our team and upcoming performances at luxeterra.com and find us on Facebook and Twitter at Luxeterra. That's L-U-X-T-A-T-E-R-R-A. Transmission is a production of Toaster Lab in Canada and is a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas in the United States.